Uh, anyways, we have Scott here from The Collects. How you doing, Scott? I'm good. How are you? Dude, doing well. Uh, that set was super sick. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude. Um, do you want to just like talk about The Collects a little bit, I guess, real quick? Sure, sure. Um, it's been a project I've had for about a decade. Mm -hmm. I just occasionally uh, use it as a moniker. Um, the focus is uh, more occult than anything else. Okay. You know, bringing the light and the dark together and just uh, creating an atmosphere, so to speak. Nice. Yeah. Do you think we could pull the mic a little bit closer? Yeah, cool. Awesome. There we go. That sounds better. Um, that's really cool. Uh, so, Scott, I also wanted to ask, too, like, you know, what have you been up to recently? How's, like, I guess, like, life been going, dude? Uh, life is what it is, I guess, currently. Yeah. Uh, making You're, a lot of music. You got in Ventura, right? Yeah, that's where you, that's where you live? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I'm a part of the Slugs Fitter family. Uh -huh. uh, a bunch of bands out in Ventura. Cool. Uh, just uh, just kind of creating music, just trying to keep doing nice. what we do. I know you've been in music forever. Uh, before we like jump a little bit into that, I guess like, do you have any like hobbies outside of music that you do? Like, I don't know. Do you do like drawing or something? I don't know. I like to draw. Yeah, definitely. I'm, a, sh I'm a chef by trade. Yeah, you're a chef. That's what you're telling yeah. me. That's cool. So, how'd you get into cooking? Um, it's just another. It's just a, another outlet, I guess, of art, mm -hmm. of punk rock, and yeah, you know, it's just something I got into at a young age. We were always active about what we were into, uh -huh. and uh, you know, learning how to. Uh, eat as vegetarians i guess growing up yeah that's what you were saying so like you were were you like vegan or i've been vegan on and off i've also okay. eaten meat on and off throughout my life okay yeah i went to culinary school and uh had to learn everything there and where'd you go to culinary school in san francisco sick cca was school up there nice yeah so um did you ever like travel like what was would you like work at like high-end restaurants or like what was like your what, what kind of stuff would you do French food was really my focus. And okay. In my early 20s, I just kind of took off to California mm -hmm. and uh, just went to resort communities, Aspen, Colorado. Somehow ended up in Minnesota at one point. Oh, nice. Yeah. Not so nice, but yeah. <laughs> brought me back to California and then, yeah. you know, cooked around all the major cities here. And, nice. Yeah. So what was your favorite restaurant you've ever worked at over all these years? Hmm. There was a restaurant in San Francisco called Fairlawn. Mm -hmm. and uh, it had beautiful like uh, sculptures inside the restaurant mm -hmm. one night and it had an uh, open kitchen I loved working there that was a nice we'd always have nice people coming in there and, cool yeah do you still cook? cook at home all the time yeah. so you don't like work like as a chef anymore? no I do boring business management type stuff nowadays I mean somebody's gotta do it you know yeah, what I mean? yeah exactly yeah that's sick so um I guess like what's your what's your favorite dish? What is my favorite dish? I don't know. I've been um, experimenting with Japanese food a lot lately. Nice. And just like refining a small amount of ingredients with a, a wide variety of end results. Cool. So that's kind of something I've been into. And, uh, nice. My partner isn't vegetarian, so uh, trying to consistently uh, create dishes that she'll like as much as I do is... Yeah, that's always, awesome. Yeah, you know, part of it. So if you have, like, a tip for anybody that, like, wants to get better at cooking, what would you say? Like, what would you say to them? Watch videos online. Uh, watch Julia Childs. Hell yeah. You know, uh, read books. Get a subscription to a magazine. Sick. You know, go out to dinner. Find things you like, find things you don't like. Hell yeah. Um, try to make things at home. Make them over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, dude, so I guess, like, jumping into, like, music and stuff, like, how long have you been in DIY? Like, how'd you get your start? Like, when, from when we were talking before, it was just so fascinating. You've been, like, in so many different, like, scenes and all that stuff. I was I was fortunate to grow up in Thousand Oaks in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when mm -hmm. punk rock was just there. Hardcore yeah. music existed there. So I, I kind of got into DIY just from the get-go, being mm -hmm. into skateboarding, and we would see... Uh, you know, people would tag up the, the skate parks with, like, or the, the ditches with, like, logos of bands. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, a record store not too far, far from my house, and I would go in there and find the records of the bands and be like, oh, I saw that logo, I want that Bad Brains record. Or oh, record sick. Was. And then, uh, you know, we had bands like Strife and Still Life and mm -hmm. Thousand Oaks that were a, 
a major thing and they were doing shows and it was you know it was a very easy transition being a kid i was into skateboarding going straight into the music scene yeah it was just it was very much there growing up i think it's crazy too how many people that like we've talked to on tbd like a lot of like these older punk people like all got into music through like punk music at least and stuff and i guess hip-hop as well but it's all through skating yeah definitely. you know what i mean like people definitely. found like music through skate videos primarily yeah it's, you know it's outsider um, culture yeah you know, it was all like intertwined yeah but definitely, definitely. yeah it's like so cool um i mean i always skated back in the day and one of the main ways i would find cool bands is like through like the dvd i would buy at the skate shop or something you know what i mean yeah Yeah. that's sick yeah um so we were like talking about like still life um and them being like a more park band they were on ebullition too which was like a really cool like galita label Um, essential label yeah yeah, an essential galita label they put out tons of like punk bands that are just important to like the history of like world punk um but like I guess, like, how did you get into, like, booking, and how did you, did you, like, just start going to shows in, like, Santa Barbara, like, all over the 805, or, like, how did... Well, back, it was, it was before the internet, so we would have, we would order records from Evolution, and then they would send us a bunch of flyers for shows coming out. Oh, that's sick. And, uh, you know, my mom would initially take me to shows. Uh-huh. I remember my mom took me to a show in L.A., she took me to see a uh, Manus Bastard No Comment. Oh, that's crazy. At the Anti Club, and she sat in out front and waited for it to be done. Oh, really? Damn, that's out. wild. Yeah, it was. Uh, but initially, it was about wanting to bring the bands closer to where I live. Yeah. And you know, it was like I said, punk was so active where we were that we didn't realize like the greatness that we were always associating. With. Yeah. It was. We didn't have any idea that in 25, 30 years, these bands were going to be renowned you know uh-huh. they'd play to a room of 15 people and it was, uh-huh. like, we made it yeah and uh it was it was just like i saw other people doing it i wanted to do it it was just about keeping a, a society going you know a community so you were you playing in bands too at the time when i first i i wasn't initially i was just getting the bands to come to the area yeah i just, I just had a uh, an admiration for what was going on uh-huh. but then you know like anything else i started playing in bands and and totally found a new love in life after that. But yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned as well that, like, you were going to, like, the Pickle Patch and stuff, like, in Santa Barbara. I don't know. Can you just, like, talk a little bit of just about, like, the local, like, punk history and stuff, if you have anything to, like, say, like, for any of, like, the local people and stuff? It's, it's actually wild because nowadays with all these uh, reissues coming out, mm-hmm. we see people... Uh, just, just flocking to these bands by the thousands and it's wild to think that when we were growing up 15 20 people would be a full show yeah and if we really needed a bigger venue we would go to the living room that could fit maybe mm-hmm. 50 yeah you know, and the living room is a spot in galita for anybody that's unaware yeah I be- it's moved around i believe has it not i think so i think there's a couple locations yeah yeah but uh yeah, it was just it was there was just a community, and we would we would have to keep in touch with each other through like uh, you know fanzines and just like keeping mm-hmm. you know bands would get interviewed, we'd find out about the next band, we would read you know an issue of Heart Attack and find out about you know different records coming out, and those bands would want to come on tour. And yeah, did you ever have your name and like book your own effing life? Um, I don't know if I had my name in there, but that was. That was an essential resource for me yeah. growing up. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I booked a U.S. tour for a hardcore band I was in in the early 90s and did it all out of that book on my home phone. That's so sick. And my mom still to this day talks about how much I rang up that uh, phone bill. Oh, really? Yeah, because yeah. it would cost by the minute back then. Dude, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, for anybody that doesn't know what Book Your Own Effing Life was, it was just like a phone book in a way of just like people all over the country that were booking DIY shows and like that's how you would like bands and yeah. venues of every uh-huh. town and places to eat that were punk friendly and whatnot. Oh really? They had like place to eat too? Oh, that's definitely, sick. Definitely. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. We we've talked to a few people like in Chicago as well that like we're talking to like uh, the band Fax. Do you know Fax at all? They're like a trouble in my mind band, but anyways they were um telling us that like when they were playing in old like punk bands in like the 90s that they were also using that book to like i just think it's crazy how like the whole like country was like using that book 
to book their tours and it was like everybody was doing that it's there like so only, wild there was a small handful of zines that everything was coming out of too yeah so, i mean we had punk planet and heart attack maximum mm-hmm. rock and roll you know and they were giving us all the information wasn't like heart attack and like maximum rock and roll like associated with like santa barbara or something i forget or like wasn't ken mcclard or something was, was the editor of heart attack okay yeah okay and that I don't remember exactly how it goes, but it was, uh, Kent was one of the columnists for, for Maxwell for years, and Heart Attack kind of was a spin-off of that. Okay. You know, Kent had a different focus than, than what was going on at Maxwell. I also remember reading, like, some history of, like, emo or something, and they were saying that, like, one of those, um one of those zines or whatever basically coined the term emo for, like, Still Life, and they are saying that Still Life was, like, the first emo band or something like that. I don't know how accurate that is, but that was something I was reading online that they, like, quoted. Still Life was the quintessential emo band. There's an old issue of Maximum that has a bunch of punk rock characters on it of each of the different, like, subgenres of the scene. Mm-hmm. And so they have, like, the crust punk, and maybe it would have a, you know, some patch on it. But the emo guy had a Still Life patch on it, and that kind of, like, solidified them. Oh, that's sick. Nowadays, yeah. you'll hear people talking about, you know, Embrace and earlier bands but emo really started up when with bands like you know still life and evergreen yeah. even bands like antioch arrow and stuff yeah. out of san diego it's turned into a different thing nowadays but yeah um yeah modern day emo is definitely different from what it was back in the day Absolutely. but um yeah. i still love it either way it goes yeah. through like different waves it's all good yeah. but um anyways did you ever like listen to like indian summer like any of those bands great bands great yeah. bands yeah were, was, were you ever able to like see them live and stuff? I saw Indian Summer a few times. First time I saw them was actually at the living room nice. down the street. Uh, yeah, I think the Swing Kids played that show too. Oh, sick! And uh, I was actually really into Sinker, which was the band before Indian Summer. Oh, okay. So when Indian Summer came out, it was it was exciting for all of us. Yeah. And uh, I think it was it they had a split with Current, I believe, too. And I was really oh, into yeah. that band at the time. Mm-hmm. But uh. Yeah, I ended up doing a couple festivals. I set up at a church in Simi Valley. Mm-hmm. There was a, a band in Simi called Jigsaw, and there was a, a guy named Jimmy in that band that somehow enabled us to, to set up a show in a church, and we were able to bring a whole bunch of bands there. We had, you know, we had Evergreen show up. So sick. Indian Summer. Insane. I can't believe there. Indian Summer played in Simi Valley. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. I live in Simi Valley right now. Like, I grew up there, and it's like, there's nothing happening in Simi Valley. I mean, Rapid's kind of cool right now. True, true. Um, And they're doing cool stuff, but it was like, before that, like, I didn't even know, like, what real punk was growing up, because, like, there was nothing happening there. You know what I mean? When I was younger, Simi Valley was the place, though. That's so crazy. There was, uh, Cheers was a bar, and it was totally based off the the Boston bar. Yeah. But they had straight edge shows there. So we would see like bands like Outspoken and Endpoint and whatnot play at this little bar. And then they had uh, Bouncing Souls and Lifetime play. The first time Bouncing Souls came to California was in <laughs> Simi Valley. That's so crazy. And uh, you know, there, were, there used to be a bunch of shows there. That's so cool. That band Far, they used to play there all the time. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. Dude, so, I mean, how did you manage to, like, just stay in DIY for, like, so long? You've been in it for, like, ever, like, through, like, the golden age of punk. Like, did you ever get, like, burnt out or anything? Certainly. Totally. But, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's like a blessing and a curse when, like, great things are happening. Mm-hmm. You feel, like, really important to be a part of it. But it's, like, uh, we didn't really, like, pick punk rock because it was just a cool thing to do. It uh-huh. was, it was things didn't make sense in normal society and we were we were kind of making things make sense to us yeah and, and uh you know still you know I'm in, I'm in my mid-40s and it's i still i understand things how i understand things and yeah i think it's it's just punk doesn't really live leave us you know mm-hmm. we just we have to adapt to it differently but mm-hmm. you know the ethics are still still there and they're still alive yeah so I guess, like, how did you start getting into, like, noise and, like, ambient and stuff like that? Like, it's kind of crazy, too. I feel like me and uh, my friend Justin, he was just in here. We were just talking about how, like, the the hardcore to, like, noise pipeline is, like, just such a thing that, like, yeah. we always hear people it's, it's get their It's just about experimentation. From. I think it comes from uh, 
hooking up pedals to your guitar. And yeah. Probably, you know, all of a sudden you start hearing feedback, and you're like, I didn't do that necessarily strumming this chord. Uh-huh. And then uh, it just kind of goes from there. I uh, I lived in San Diego when I really discovered noise. Uh-huh. There was a record store down there off the record, it was called, and they had a noise section. Oh, sick. And I remember stumbling on, you know, everything from like, Mersbo to the Halfler Trio to the Stars of the Lid all at the same time. Yeah. Which are like, you know, polar opposites of noise, so to speak. Oh, for sure, yeah. And, uh, you know, from there I found just other people that were interested in uh-huh. and whatnot. And it just, there's a whole like subculture that exists of mm-hmm. experimental music. And to some they call it noise, others they don't, you know, but you kind of find it all within all underground genres, uh-huh. you know, like. Free jazz. You won't find too many free jazz musicians wanting to call himself noise, but yeah, for sure, know, it's still like it's all part of the same realm. I feel like in a way, same comprehension, yeah. I guess, of art or mm-hmm. expression. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess like who is most like influential to you? Like when you started like getting into like noise and stuff. Like what were you listening to at the time that was like okay, this is like kind of like opening up my mind to like these new ideas and stuff. One of the first things that really blew my mind was a, a duo called Flying Saucer Attack. Oh, insane, yeah. yeah. They're crazy. And mm-hmm. it kind of took like some ideas that I had heard on like Jesus and the Mary Chain Psycho Candy where there was like extra layers of distortion. Uh-huh. And then like Flying Saucer Attack just kind of pushed that even further uh-huh. where it was like everything was blown out but somehow it was still serene. Uh-huh. And I, that, was, that was a big... Uh, a big turning point for me and then I got into a lot of the uh, more obscure avant industrial stuff throbbing okay. gristle and then yeah. out, you know a nurse with wound and things of oh, that sick. nature uh-huh. and uh, where it's just almost anti-music yeah. and, and the more you study in each layer you go down into there's all sorts of, of different uh, pockets everywhere all sorts of exciting different like, things to discover and noise were you ever uh, listening to like Amps for Christ and stuff like that? I know you mentioned like Man is the Bastard. Big, time, big time. But Barnes was uh, back in the old Man is the Bastard days. He was playing guitar. And it yeah. was, we'd be blown away watching the guy because he built his guitar and he would build his amp and it would make these sounds like we didn't just, we didn't understand. Them. Yeah. And uh, Amps for Christ is a good example because it like, it heads off in the folk directions and it yeah. opens up like totally different doors, you mm-hmm. know, to. <laughs> you know psychedelic elements in music Henry is like one of the nicest people I think that I've ever met like I had the band he plays in Gun Outfit on my radio show like before COVID um, very cool yeah they're like super good and then just talking to Henry I was like dude what the heck like you're the Amster Christ guy like I didn't know that you played and like that's wild that you're just here right now you're like a legend you yeah. know what I mean yeah. yeah and he was just like oh like super humble and stuff you know I'm sure people feel weird when you're just like dude you're a legend you know what I mean yeah, but like he was like uh, oh yeah and then like I emailed him because, like, I would just communicate with him via email. That's, like, what he gave me. And I just thought it was funny. Like, he didn't have his, like, name associated with, like, his email or anything. He went by, like, Enid Snarb or something on there. And, like, he was going to come in and play a solo set on the station. And he doesn't have a car. So he was literally going to rent a car and come up here just to, like, play. And I was like, Henry, dude, like, you don't have to go through all this just to play my show. But, like, I appreciate it. You know what I mean? Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and then COVID happened, and, like, we it ended up not happening. But I want to get him in here at some point, just because, like, yeah. Amps for Christ is just, like, one of those bands. Like, I found, like, all of their CDs in the station library, and I was just like, dude, this is the most insane stuff I've ever heard. Game changer. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's, like, it goes from, like, this nice, like, Christian-influenced folk into mm-hmm. just absolute, like, just chaos and noise. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, crazy, like, blend of stuff. But, um... Yeah, dude, that's awesome. So, yeah, I, amazing. I guess, do you want to kind of talk about um, some of like the modern music and stuff that you're making, like some of the current stuff that you're doing, like, um, like how did it culminate all to like what you're making now, like with a uh, slurred oath and like some of your current projects? I think with uh, slurred, slurred oath, the, the concept was to uh, to take noise and avant music and make it as uh, mellow as possible yeah and um with vanessa i'm fortunate to have somebody who can really sing and it kind of mm-hmm. opens up doors that you know i haven't been able to work with in other areas like uh, i can scream and make some grunts but to have someone that can actually sing kind of changes the whole uh, the whole idea 
So uh, it, it's just been fun exploring. That's, that's kind of something with music I like to do. I'm not, uh -huh. I'm not looking to play something someone else is playing. Yeah. I, I want to create something new. And I think that's, uh -huh. that's, that's kind of the joy of, of noise is like there is no limits. Yeah. You know, you, you can make a country noise band if you want to. You For know? sure. I know you're mentioning too. You had like a really crazy mashup on on Slug Spitter. Uh, it was like your reggae and like what was the? It was like a dub and then a, um, black metal mashup or something like that. Or it's not, yeah, Babylon Resin Alter. Okay. It's, it's uh, I mean, I, I I really got into reggae in the last few years, and I, yeah. I found it to be uh, the parallels between punk rock and reggae is just mm -hmm. it's it's happening simultaneous, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. I just kind of. Wrote some songs and it kind of came out like a, almost a goth version of like if The Cure was playing reggae. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, I got my buddy Pete from Harasser to come do some vocals on it. Nice. It's, it's kind of just like a crazy mix of stuff. We haven't. Uh, it's not released yet. I haven't really spoke about it too many times, but it's just oh, okay. Just yeah. something fun to do. Yeah. Sorry about that. Didn't no, mean no, to, no, it's, to blow it's, it out. But no, this is the first time it's been shared with people. It was on the. The playlist tonight so it's cool yeah so what are you intending to do with like your label slugs bitter like how did you start that it's a uh it's a private press label i'm intending to do whatever i want to do with that given yeah moment. like uh i don't really have a website for it i i give a little information out when i do releases of, of bigger quantities but the idea is just to have an outlet to create music mm -hmm. and, and put it out there yeah and um you know, started with doing runs of 25 tapes. So I've done a couple of lathe releases. Oh, nice. But it's it's just small run stuff. Keep We have a, have a good in-house team that we, we work on the art together. And cool. It's just a, a fun group of people that we're creating cool stuff. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, um, I think we're kind of like running out of time. It's 57. So, I mean, I kind of only got one more question left here. It's kind of the biggest one of the show. Um, you ready for it? Let's do it. So a rat is going to jump into your mouth. Do you want this rat to jump into your mouth head first or butt first and why? Oh, that's a good one. Right? Yeah. Um, he's going in head first because we're just, because he's already going in there. Things are already getting crazy. He, he, yeah. We might as well just pure chaos. He's going to bite my tongue. I don't know. He's going for that little thing that dangles in the back of the mouth. We're going all the way, I guess. Hell yeah. Yeah. I like how you embraced the chaos because, like, most people on the show, like, don't embrace the chaos. They go for, like, the least, like, I don't know, painful method or something. They'll, like, butt first because it won't bite me. And I just like your answer because oh, nobody yeah. has given it. That's why this yeah, question's yeah. so good okay. because it's always different. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hope I don't get a rat in the mouth, though. <laughs> Henry from Amps for Christ said that he would take it butt first and slurp the tail down like spaghetti. I thought that was the most, one of the most unique answers yes. I've ever got. Yes. That's and I was solid. like, hell yeah, Henry, that was sick. That's solid. Yes. Yeah. His whole band didn't want to answer it. It was funny. Like the rest of the band was like, uh, and then Henry hops on mic. Oh, I'll take it butt first and just slurp the tail down like spaghetti. And I was just like, sounds good, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, uh, where can people keep up with all things, your music? Um, uh, Slurred Oath on Instagram. That's, cool. That's the main outlet I send everything out in. Awesome. Yep. Cool. Well, you can see one of Scott's projects tomorrow. It's going to be uh, Sheep Ditch. And who's in Sheep Ditch with you? Sheep Ditch is myself and Jay Howard, who is uh, Circuit Wound. And Kesem, right? Yes, he's in Kesem as and well. And Kesem. So those are two really cool projects. Um, but yeah, Sheep Ditch will be playing tomorrow with... Uh, Delilah Queiroz and Danilo Casti from Sardinia, Italy, um, all the way from the other side of the pond. Um, and then we got Hid Hawk and Mean Streets, as well as Ian McPhee, and it's going to be a control disco. You can find more info uh, at TBD Presents on Instagram or Twitter. You can go to the link in the bio, and you can find the link there for all the information about that show. Uh, this has been another episode of TBD. Thanks so much for joining me, Scott. This was super fun. Thank you so much.